Well, in my presentation, I'm going to talk about some approach that combine high throughput proteomic data and uh, network-based approach for uh, processing this data and interpreting this data. In particular, uh, approach based on protein-protein interaction network analysis. These approach are useful applied in our lab to investigate complex disease, but may be applied to investigate uh, also less complex disease or less complex phenotype like uh, complex or less complex sample. But in the case of complex disease, I think that may be fruitful because complex diseases usually are uh, uh, multifactorial. And so this approach takes into consideration a multiple ensemble of elements and may result useful for identifying multiple targets. In nowadays, uh, are available different omics technologies that allow to produce a uh, big amount of, uh, of data per experiment, and it simply different step, sorry, like data storage, handling, preprocessing, analysis, and data integration. In fact, uh, several studies are using this omics data and are trying to integrate this omics data for describe uh, the systems. And this is possible thanks to approach based on systems biologies that uh, are based on a holistic view of the system. So uh, this approach aim to analyze and uh, uh, define the relationship among molecules, uh, so understand how these molecules cooperate for, uh, um, uh, for the systems. So the idea is to produce uh, uh, experimental omics data, in our case uh, proteomics data, and combine them with knowledge that are represented by protein-protein interaction or protein-DNA interaction, or other knowledge to make new hypotheses that uh, um, uh, have to be uh, validated with uh, other experiment. But the problem is uh, not the integration of different kind of data, but their correlation. Uh, in these studies, uh, authors uh, try to correlate protein level and transcript level, but in any case, uh, the correlation was very poor. For example, in this study of 2009, uh, the best correlation was found for risk with a half square of 0 0.58, uh, uh, or in these other studies, the authors uh, put in relation uh, proteomic data obtained using different software or different index like this, uh, that is normalized spectral abundance factor, with the transcript level uh, obtained by macroarray or RNA seq experiment. And also in this case, the correlation was poor. The best correlation was 0 0.54. Uh, like it was poor, the uh, correlation between the half life of uh, transcript and protein. This is due to a different factor that regulates this process like transcriptional, translational factor, or protein degradation, or uh, the uh, activity of uh, microRNA. So it is important uh, to investigate the protein disease, uh, protein directly, because uh, um, it is not possible to infer the protein level uh, from the transcript level. This is uh, a graph that uh, uh, shows uh, the number of studies that combine gene expression data with network analysis, and the number is higher than uh, studies that combine protein expression and network analysis, but uh, this number is set to increase in these uh, next few years. Well, about the systems of a cell, so genome, transcriptome, proteome, the proteome is for sure the more complex system, are estimated about one million of protein form. 
So we need technologies able to face this complexity. The whole technology used for separate protein is based on two-dimensional gel and electrophoresis is still used in many labs and for some aspects uh, is uh, valid, but for sure is not an attribute technologies. Other technologies have been developed like CELD or protein array. Both are based on chip that contain bait protein that capture protein and a beta molecule that capture protein. And in the case of um, Protein Harry may be interesting because uh, when bait protein are uh, bait molecular protein on peptide, uh, this uh, technology is, is useful for identify protein protein interaction. But for sure, the gold standard technologies for discover uh, for quantify protein at large scale level is based on combination uh, between uh, liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. Uh, thanks to this uh, combination, uh, uh, the combination of these two technologies, uh, thanks to the development of mass spectrometry instrument, uh, um, high performing, it is possible uh, to identify 1,000 protein per sample. At the moment, uh, exist three different methods of acquisition at mass spectrometry level called uh, data-dependent analysis for short gap proteomics, uh, use, uh, use, uh, usually uh, for a discovery a quantification purpose, or single reaction or multiple reaction monitoring for a targeted proteomics uh, useful for validation purpose. And finally, the last technology developed is uh, SWOT mass spectrometry or data-independent analysis that is uh, useful for discovery and validation uh, uh, purpose. And these last technologies, what mass spectrometry, should improve the number of protein identified per experiment. But at the moment, uh, the number uh, obtained by data dependent analysis, so short gun proteomics, uh, data independent analysis, are very comparable. <coughs> These are the instruments available uh, in uh, our lab. We have uh, five different systems that combine liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. In particular, uh, three of these uh, systems combine uh, two-dimensional liquid chromatography with, with mass spectrometry. And uh, some of these instruments may be used also for analyze uh, intact protein, purified intact protein to obtain uh, structural or uh, post translational modification information. But usually in our lab, we use this system for analyze at large scale level our sample. And the approach that we used is called multidimensional protein identification technologies. It is made by several steps. The first step is uh, protein extraction. After protein extraction, uh, protein are digested with uh, an enzyme, usually trypsin. And the peptide mixture is uh, separated by two different columns of liquid chromatography, <laughs> usually based on uh, anion exchange and uh, reverse phase. And automatically, peptide diluted by liquid chromatography are inserted in, uh, uh, are ionized, and then and finally uh, analyzed by mass spectrometry analysis. And for each peptide, uh, one spectra or more spectra are uh, registered and then finally uh, processed to obtain a long list of protein. In this picture, uh, I reported uh, uh, the identified protein uh, in relation to the isolating point and molecular weight. It is to highlight that it is possible uh, identify also protein with extreme uh, molecular weight or extreme isolatric point because uh, we analyze peptide. And this is impossible with technology like uh, gel electrophoresis. And it is interesting that we can reach a um, sensitivity of a hot mole of protein concentration uh, if we analyze the tissue are sufficient five to 10 milligrams of tissues uh, or 
and we obtain usually 100 or 1,000 protein per sample, but this number may change in relation to different variables. Well, this is the scheme that we describe how experimental spectra are processed to identify the protein list. Uh, the experimental spectra are compared to virtual spectra in silico digested or in silico producted by using a FASTA database or is a, a simply text uh, file that contain our protein uh, <coughs> sequencing. And finally, the result is a list of all peptide and a list of, of uh, corresponding parent protein. And uh, it is interesting that uh, the profile that we identify, so spectra, peptide, protein, uh, contain a specific uh, signature of the system that we analyze. And in this work, we uh, demonstrated the good reproducibility of this data, and we used this profile to classify a new sample, so uh, for a diagnostic purpose. And we found, for example, that using protein and peptide, in comparison to spectra, we obtain a, a better performance of classification. In particular, using peptide in for this collection, we used two different collection of data, we obtained 100% of a good accuracy. So all unknown samples were exactly classified using this, uh, this data. For come back about the software used for uh, uh, process, uh, uh, the experimental spectra of this uh, study were compared to different software, so different algorithms for analyzed spectra, and uh, put in relation the number of interpreted spectra and the number in the red of peptide identified. My opinion is difficult to compare this software because they are based on different algorithms, uh, um, are based on different parameters used for uh, filter the result. And uh, in fact, the idea is to process our experimental spectra using different search engine, and then use all protein identified by this uh, search engine to improve also the coverage of the protein identified. In our lab, we use the sequest algorithms, that is the holder algorithm developed for uh, uh, processing spectra. And now we are using also this software called PIX. And this software is very interesting because it allows the, the novel sequencing. The novel sequencing is the possibility to uh, process a spectra without use a, a database. And this is uh, maybe useful for a study like this, where we analyze the immunoglobulin light change uh, from amyloidosis patients. Uh, and it is useful for identifying specific peptide from variable region, peptide that are not present in a database. And so without a software like this, it is impossible to identify. Well, in addition to amyloidosis, uh, the other topics about clinical proteomics uh, in our lab uh, are cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurodegenerative disease, and micro microorganisms, or pulmonary disease. And in this context, we have analyzed uh, a wide range of samples uh, from uh, uh, different uh, organisms like human, pig, uh, uh, mouse, uh, we have analyzed fresh tissues, uh, paraffin embedded tissues, uh, uh, urine, hexosome, and so on. And we have analyzed also uh, sample uh, derived, uh, derived from plant. Concerning clinical proteomics, this is the pipeline that we use for analyze, for investigate our sample. So, from proteomic profile, we 
identify differential expressed proteins. These two data are used for analyze protein-protein interaction network uh, and so to try to infer molecular mechanism or uh, uh, differential expressed proteins are used for identify real biomarker and so for monitoring sample uh, for diagnostic purpose and for stratify uh, uh, patient in this case. And in this context is uh, important the stratification. Stratification that may be done at molecular level after proteomic analysis, but um, stratification that in my opinion is very important before the molecular analysis. Because a good stratification at histological and clinical level may allow us to better correlate the result that we obtain with our approach. These are some of the computational tools that we use in our lab, in particular Maproma software and Epiware um, are made and developed. That is used for identify differential expressed protein, while HEP is used for identify prototypic peptide. And then we use other uh, uh, common statistics for process data and uh, cytoscape for investigate protein-protein interaction uh, uh, network. Concerning quantitative analysis, we use a label-free approach. Uh, label-free approach or label approach are sure more accurate than label-free approach, but different study like this, but uh, there are a lot of study have demonstrated that label free approach are very effective to identify differential expressed protein. For example, in this work, the authors put in relation the expected ratio for a given protein and the ratio obtained using normalized spectral counting. And the correlation was very good. So, in our procedure for identify differential expressive protein, we use a label-free approach based on spectral count. Spectral count is simply the number of peptides identified for a given protein. So the concept is if I identify more peptides for a protein in a sample in comparison to another sample, probably this protein is more expressed. And we use two different strategies. The first strategy is uh, process the average spectral count, for example, of a group of uh, healthy control uh, against the uh, average spectral count of a disease group. And to, to make this comparison, we use index like Dave or DCI inserted in Maproma software, but Several index uh, to make this kind of work are available in literature. And the other approach uh, is a little different because we use all these metrics of data, so um, contain for each subject the protein level, and we process these data metrics using statistical like discriminant analysis. And this allowed to extract protein that change, uh, that reproducibly change uh, for each subject in uh, the group of healthy and for each subject for each uh, of the group of the disease. And this allowed also to identify in this group the subject that uh, have a, a strange level of protein in comparison to the other. And that may represent probably special case or, or specific case. This is an example of study published in uh, 2013, where we analyzed the secretome of cardiomyocyte, mouse cardiomyocyte, and uh, we analyzed two different populations, a uh, population of one type cardiomyocyte and a population of cardiomyocyte overexpressing uh, microRNA1. We performed the uh, proteomic analysis and we compared by label-free approach these uh, two different profiles. 
And among the protein differential expressed, we found a fatty acid binding protein free. Protein that was uh, then uh, uh, validated uh, in uh, mouse, but also in, uh, um, in patients, human patients, and uh, was found a, an indirect correlation between the level of this protein and the level uh, of the microRNA1. This to highlight the, the effectiveness of the label-free approach to identify potential uh, real biomarker. Well, the final result <coughs> or the first final result of our analysis are thousands of proteins and usually hundreds of differential expressed proteins. And the interpretation uh, is uh, hard without use um, computational tool. Our main collaborator <coughs> or uh, our main partner are hospitals or clinicians and this is the reaction to <laughs> long list uh, of, uh, of protein. So for uh, to face this need but uh, uh, also for us for interpreting this data uh, we have developed uh, uh, some approach that allow us to present data in a more readable form. The simplest analysis to analyze at system level a long list of protein like a long list of genes is represented by gene ontology analysis. There are some tools that allow this uh, computation and uh, uh, the result is, uh, for example, uh, the pathway enriched in our sample. This is a, a, an example that shows the pathway enriched in uh, pig cardiac tissues, where we found uh, a pathway related to metabolism, uh, genetic information processing, cytoskeleton, and so on. And it is interesting that the level of enrichment of this pathway may be compared uh, between different conditions. So we have a preliminary uh, result uh, about what uh, is changing uh, between uh, our systems. But uh, to, mo to go more in depth of the molecule uh, that uh, have uh, an important role in this process, we are now using uh, uh, approach based on network analysis. Network uh, are a universal language used uh, in many areas, uh, ranging from social network, electronics, uh, internet, or simply a map, and of course uh, in uh, biology. In biology, uh, available different kind of a system or different kind of a representation uh, for a biological system, as is the signal transduction network, transcriptional network, metabolic network, and so on. But what is a network? A network at mathematical level is uh, represented by a sparse matrix, and at a visual level is represented by nodes that may be protein, gene, metabolite, and edge. Edge describes the relation between these two nodes that may be a physical interaction, a reaction, or regulation. As this different kind of a network, a complex or less complex, as this directed network, so this node influences this node, or no directed network, or, or network where the edge is weighted uh, in relation to some probability for example, that the interaction is true or is false, uh, and so on. In our study, in particular, we use protein-protein interaction network, so that is called the interatom. Protein-protein interaction network are a physical interaction between protein, uh, interaction due to electrostatic force that um, are formed uh, only under uh, biological condition. And the interatom is uh, a good representation of the organization of uh, a cell. 
this information, so about protein-protein interaction, I've been collected in this year by literature, or using a different approach, in particular is the hybrid to verify if two proteins interact, or crystallography, or in the last years also the use of co-immunoprecipitation with mass spectrometry allowed to uh, define if two proteins interact or not. And the accumulation of this data has also driven the development of a specific repository that represents an important part for uh, make this kind of uh, studies. Uh, Organisms like human, yeast, E. coli are well la la represented about protein-protein interaction, also mouse, but uh, other for other organisms exist very few interactions in this database. But what is important to investigate uh, in a network to identify the more important protein? It's important to investigate uh, its structure. This is the typical structure of a biological network and some study uh, uh, say that the structure of biological network is uh, similar to a structure called scale-free and small world network. What means scale-free and small world? Means that uh, in biological network, many nodes have uh, only one connection or few connections, while uh, few nodes are highly connected. And these nodes are usually called up and should represent the uh, molecule uh, that uh, have an important topological uh, relevance for network organization. And it means also that uh, each node in biological network can be reached by other nodes through a small number of steps. And this gives uh, the, 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 the measure of the connectivity of a network. It is interesting these uh, studies where the author put in relation the connectivity of each node, so the number of interaction of each node with uh, uh, their lethality. So a uh, node uh, with a high interaction or the knockout of uh, uh, gene corresponding to node with high interaction uh, were more lethal than uh, the knockout of gene corresponding to node with a few interactions. Usually I use uh, this picture to explain better this concept. This is a simply map of airport. And if we imagine to block an airport with a lot of a connection, probably we create a crash of our systems. And in addition to identify hubs, so the node that have a topological relevant um, role in the network organization, uh, another important aspect for analyzed network is identify module. So uh, cluster of nodes, in this case cluster of proteins that are highly connected and probably that are also functionally connected. And why not probably, and why not uh, node that are uh, functionally connected uh, that change their expression among the investigated uh, uh, condition or, or systems. These are some tool, uh, uh, computational tool for uh, uh, process the protein-protein interaction network and above all uh, cytoscape uh, developed by Institute of Systems Biology in Seattle and uh, some plugins of cytoscape that uh, allow to make different uh, processing in particular uh, this plugin called Sentiscape developed by Giovanni Scardoni in, uh, compu uh, from Computational uh, Biomedical Center in Verona. And this plugin uh, allows us to analyze at topological level uh, uh, how our network. But 
I will extract node or protein that have a, a topological relevant node in uh, the network organization. We use some parameters called also centralities. The, the simplest uh, uh, parameter is the degree that represents the number of connection of a node. In this case, node 1 uh, have a degree of 5. In this case, uh, node 1 have a higher number of connections, so probably is more important in our network. Another parameter that we used is called centroid and measure the capacity of a node to coordinate the activity of other nodes. For example, in this free network, the node 1 uh, has uh, the same degree, that is uh, 6, but from network A to network C, the centroid value increases. And finally, other two interesting centrality used for analyze our network are stress and uh, betweenness. They are similar, but the betweenness is more informative than stress. Um, in particular, stress represents the number of shortest paths that are through a node, while the betweenness gives the measure of um, our node is uh, able to connect uh, uh, communicating protein. And again, among these two networks, the level of the be betweenness increases from the network A to the network B for the node 4. Because if I block this node in this network, each of these nodes may be connected with the other node through the node 10 and the node 9. But if I block the node 4 in this network, my network is completely disconnected. And pro uh, probably so I introducing uh, uh, an important uh, crash. Well, in our lab, this is the procedure to analyze uh, network um, protein-protein interaction network. Uh, the protein profile that we identify by MADPIT approach are matched with protein-protein interaction database. So we identify a network that combined with differential expressed protein allow us to identify cluster of functionally related nodes that are upregulated or downregulated in our system. And in addiction, uh, it is possible to identify or characterize a, a specific network, for example, for ELT uh, control and a specific network for uh, uh, patients. And these two networks are evaluated at topological level and uh, in this way we are able to identify the hubs, so the protein that have uh, an important role in uh, this uh, uh, network organization. After this long premise, uh, now I want to use some example of uh, proteomic and network analysis application. The, this first uh, work that I want to show you is, uh, was just as accepted, but is a hundred press embargo, so I can't show, I'm sorry, but I can't show figure, but represent an interesting uh, example of proteomic and network application because uh, uh, the all the prediction that we made with network analysis were confirmed with uh, other method. In particular, we analyze the human lymphocyte T at uh, two different population of cell, uh, regulatory T cell and conventional uh, T cell. And uh, by our analysis, we characterize a, a different metabolism, for example, between these two populations. Regulatory T cell uh, was upregulated glycolysis or lipid synthesis that was in agreement with their high proliferative capacity, while uh, in uh, conventional T cell, we found hub-regulated some protein related to 
uh, mitochondria. And uh, I invite you to, to read this paper when it will be published because it represents a nice example of uh, our application. Another example uh, of protein and network application uh, is uh, in this study we analyze uh, uh, two different populations of oocytes. A population of oocytes was able to resume meiosis and to develop the blastitis stage following fertilization, while another population called, in this case, not surround nucleus, arrest to uh, at the two cell stage. And we correlate the incapacity of this population of cells to reach the blastitis stage with the regulation of this complex. We found at proteomic level that the two proteins of this complex were upregulated or, or, uh, with a normal uh, level, while the two proteins of this complex were downregulated. And this uh, complex is important to form the cytoplasmic lattice that contain uh, mRNA and ribosome of maternal origin. In this case, indeed, we analyzed the bronchial biopsies from patients affected by asthma. In particular, we stratify uh, the patient in two groups, a group that was able to respond uh, uh, to a uh, treatment with omalizumab, that is uh, an anti-immunoglobulin He, and a group that was unable to respond to this treatment. Also in this case, we identify more than uh, 4,000 peptides and about 1,300 uh, 1, proteins, so a big amount of data. By label frequency quantitative analysis, we found that some of protein were specifically identify, identified in uh, responder patients. And the cluster analysis of differential expressed protein was in good agreement with uh, morphometric analysis. And in particular, about this protein that may represent a reliable uh, biomarker of responder and non-responder, we found uh, an EGA binding protein that is called uh, galactin-3, and this uh, protein uh, was validated by a histochemical uh, method in uh, uh, the two population of patients. And finally, uh, like in other projects, we put our protein, our differential expressed protein, on a network, and we found that uh, in a responder patients were upregulated some protein related to actin or myosin or to extracellular matrix, while keratin proteins were upregulated in non responder patients. And in addiction, we performed a proteomic analysis uh, in uh, responder patients before treatment and after treatment, and we found that some of this protein resulted uh, after treatment down-regulated. An important topic so of our lab is based on uh, the investigation of amyloidosis disease. Uh, amyloidosis disease uh, is caused by misfolding protein uh, that uh, affect uh, also uh, different organs. And by analyzing uh, uh, the adipose tissues of uh, healthy control and patients affected by amyloidosis disease, we found about uh, more than 3,000 proteins, uh, some of them specifically identified in healthy control and uh, others specifically identified in uh, patients. It is interesting that using proteomic data, we are able to make uh, the diagnosis of these patients. So, so using proteomic data and a simple algorithm developed in our lab, we can say if a patient is affected by amyloidosis due to uh, transthyretin, uh, serum amyloid A, or by immunoglobulin K or lambda. 
and this is very important for the therapy. At the moment, uh, we have analyzed more than 100 patients affected by amyloidosis disease and a good number of HIL-T control. And all these data have been used for identify differentially expressed protein between, in this case, between uh, the control group and uh, amyloidosis patients uh, uh, affected by uh, amyloidosis uh, uh, lambda. And some of these proteins were secreted or related to extracellular matrix, so while other uh, were involved in uh, cytoskeleton function or cytosol uh, and uh, other one. And this protein, like in other cases, were put on protein-protein interaction network. And in particular, the we found that the extracellular matrix contained the most number of protein differential expressed. And this was in good agreement also with the histology of these tissues that is used uh, adipose tissue to, uh, to, to define uh, if a, a patient is affected by amyloidosis uh, or not. In 2011, we published uh, a study in collaboration with uh, Vincenzo Ilonetti of Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna about the treatment of uh, a pig uh, model uh, of myocardial infarction using uh, stem cell. In particular, we use uh, uh, unconditioned stem cell and preconditioned stem cell. And at the uh, histological level, we found that the treatment with the preconditioned stem cell induced uh, the vessel formation in uh, these uh, infarcted tissues and the presence of viable uh, uh, mitochondria and myocardium, and the reducing of the fibrosis. Now, in a study that we is in preparation, uh, we have introduced uh, a new group of sample, uh, and in particular uh, a control uh, sample, uh, so healthy sample. And, uh, we reprocess our data using not only the SARS-CoV or the pig protein database, but uh, we use uh, for processing uh, our spectra also the Homo sapiens uh, protein database. And in this way, we increase the coverage of protein identified for uh, the pig that uh, uh, in uh, its database contain not a lot, uh, not a big number of protein. And uh, in addiction, we found that some protein probably are of human origin. And it is interesting that uh, we found uh, 76 protein, and uh, among these protein, some of these are usually secreted by cells and probably represent important signal uh, secreted or released by, by this cell. So globally, we identify more than 500 differentially expressed proteins by comparing all these conditions in total, four conditions, normal, untreated tissues, and tissues treated with uh, unconditioned stem cell and with uh, preconditioned stem cell. And also with uh, unsupervised uh, uh, clustering, we found that the profile of uh, tissues treated with uh, conditioned stem cell was uh, similar to healthy control uh, rather than the other two conditions untreated or treated only with stem cell unconditioned. So after we identified this differential expressed protein, we performed network analysis. This is the network of uh, healthy control, and this is the network of uh, infected tissues not treated. Uh, it is uh, uh, clear that the expression of some protein is completely opposite. In this case, uh, uh, this cluster of protein uh, are related to extracellular matrix, uh, immunosystems, 
or released proteins that uh, were upregulated in uh, infected tissues, while this group of protein was related to mitochondrial and in infected tissues were, were downregulated. And it is interesting that after treatment with preconditioned stem cell, the proteome change in this way. So we can appreciate that the proteome or the network of this proteome go toward a state near to healthy control. But to go and this is in agreement with the histology that I showed before. So reducing of uh, uh, fibrosis and the presence of uh, viable mitochondria. But to go more in depth to this analysis, so we identified also the regulatory app. So using the centrality parameter that I showed before, we select about 100 proteins that uh, have an important role in the topology <coughs> of this network. And in addiction, these proteins not only are important at topological level, but change also their expression between this condition. And in particular, I want to show you one protein, a nucleolin, that was found uh, uh, like one of the most important protein at topological <coughs> level that is related to the formation of vessel because nucle uh, nucleolin is a marker of angiogenesis. While another group of protein related to mitochondrial respiration chain upregulated in this condition correlate uh, very well with the presence of viable mitochondria. So it is to highlight the possibility to extract uh, important protein using not only differential expressed protein, but also uh, data derived by topology of this network. This is another, <coughs> another uh, project uh, related to gastric cancer. Uh, we analyzed tissues uh, from uh, uh, different uh, uh, patients and controlled, and these tissues was, uh, uh, were paraffin embedded tissues. And also in this case, uh, from about uh, 64 samples, we identify a total of uh, 5,000 proteins corresponding to more than. 4,000 genes, and we identify a network of uh, more than uh, 3,000 nodes and uh, almost 20,000 interactions. This to highlight the complexity of this data. Also in this case, by uh, label-free quantitative approach, we identify differential expressed protein that stratify very well uh, normal tissues or tissues from cause and tumors, or able to subtype in a different kind of a tumor, like to subtype different kind of uh, normal mucosa, like intestinal, uh, anthrospelorix, or corpus. Again, differential expressed protein network, cluster of protein up and down regulated, uh, so cluster of functionally related protein up and down regulated. But that that I want to show you is, this is, for example, uh, a picture that show some protein related to angiogenesis, cell cycle, uh, or in red, uh, some tumor-related protein in orange, tumor-related blood suppressor. And it is interesting that, but as expected, that in tumor, these protein were upregulated, like protein uh, related to cell cycle or other protein related to tumors, while uh, some suppressor of tumor were down-regulated.
But that I want to show you is, uh, again, the topological analysis of this network. We identify two different networks, one for normal mucosa and one for tumors. Uh, we perform the topological analysis, and these are the first 100 topological relevant nodes. And, for example, among these nodes, there is a uh, HRBB2 that uh, was used in another kind of uh, tumor in breast cancer, like uh, a target for a monoclonal antibody. These two highlight the uh, good capacity of this approach that is a, a relatively simple approach, because we combine, in this case, uh, only the profile that we identify with our proteomic analysis with the protein-protein interaction network, without using differentially expressed proteins. So only profile and network. And in the network uh, is automatically found protein that have an important role in the network organization. And in this case, we found uh, this protein that confirm the validity of this approach. Well, finally, the last approach that I want to show you is a little different and is based on the inference of protein uh, network. This approach has been uh, widely used uh, with um, transcript level to identify co-expression network. At proteomic level, there exist very few studies that uh, combine uh, this approach with proteomics data, and none of these use a MATPIT uh, uh, approach. It is important that uh, with this approach, we can represent uh, our data in a network without the use of the protein-protein interaction database. So we don't need information about interaction of the proteins. But what is the co-expression? We say that two proteins are correlated, positive correlated, if they increase both or if uh, they decrease in the same time. On the contrary, we say that two proteins are negative correlated if one increase and the other decrease, or vice versa. In this case, is a case where protein 1 and protein 2 haven't a correlation. And using this approach, so uh, I won't stress about the fact that proteomic data is the same used for uh, uh, identify uh, functional cluster or differential expressed proteins. But what means correlation? Correlation, we are not able to say if two proteins are correlated that uh, uh, one protein may influence or cause the increase or the decrease of the other protein. Uh, for example, this is an example that show uh, two events, the falling barometer with the rain. So these two events are both true or both false. But we can't force the falling barometer to obtain rain. And so we can force the increase of this protein to obtain the increase of this protein, or on the contrary, we can, uh, for we can force the increase of this protein to obtain the decrease of this protein. But using this approach and our data, we this approach was tested uh, in um, with uh, data obtained by amyloidosis patients we obtain for each group a different network. So different relation of this protein were found in each group. And this is important, for example, also for diagnostic purpose, because uh, classical uh, uh, diagnostic method uh, don't take in consideration this relation. And we are... Um, make a study in collaboration with the University of Milano Bicocca and with the computational uh, department for classify sample using this relation. And the results are better than using uh, a classical approach uh, that are uh, 
uh, he used for classify samples. And in addition, it is interesting that the relation that we found, some of them uh, are really interaction between proteins. For example, we found it, this protein related RITPases and uh, exists a, an actual interaction between this protein, like for fibrinogen or for uh, collagen. So, this approach is able also to find a real interaction of proteins. This is a nice, a nice example because, uh, for example, we found that collagen was positive correlated. It's a complex, so probably it's normal that all these subunities are positive correlated. Like are positive correlated the subunit of, of fibrinogen. But what's interesting that we found that these two groups in their complexities were negative correlated. And in addiction, we found that these proteins were upregulated in amyloidosis patients while this complex was downregulated. And so the combination of this information probably may give us uh, more than an indication that there is a direct influencing between these two groups of proteins. And finally, uh, it's interesting another data. We found that, uh, for example, in uh, healthy control, and in patients, <coughs> the same protein show a very different degree of correlation. In this case, uh, amyloidosis patients affected by immunoglobulin K. And we found that in patients, this protein uh, was a high correlated with other protein. On the contrary, other protein like fibrinogen showed a big number of relation in uh, healthy control, while uh, showed a low <coughs> number of relation in uh, amyloidosis patients. This only to highlight that probably also this method that is independent from the other method is able to identify protein that may have a role in the phenotype that we are studying. And so may represent an alternative of investigation in particular when there is no the possibility to use the protein-protein interaction network and so for organism uh, for uh, that information are, are not available. This is the staff of uh, our lab, our chief Perligi Mauri, the guys that uh, performed the proteomic analysis, Tanila that uh, helped me about computational approach, our technician, our administrative part, and I finished my presentation. Uh, thank you for attention.